Today's review session is related to the major wars, conflicts uh, of Europe from 1337 to modern day. A particularly useful review because uh, it's very easy to get a number of these conflicts confused. They each have their own nuances. And I'd like to stress at this time that the review that we're doing today cannot be considered a replacement for the lectures that your teacher, me, for those of you watching live, but for anyone who watches this later on on YouTube, this is not to serve as a replacement that the lecture that your teacher provides you. Uh, it also will not be as thorough as the times that I went over it in lecture and class. This is meant purely as a review of the major aspects of the various conflicts uh, that many European uh, nation states became involved when, with or in over the centuries. Um, we will start with the Hundred Years' War and we will go all the way up to essentially the Cold War, which ends in 1991. Um, I'd like to also mention at this time that I don't know how far I'm going to get in this broadcast, so this single broadcast I'm going to be broadcasting for an hour and then I'm going to be done with it because I don't want to turn this into like a three hour long lecture. So however far I get uh, in one hour will be where we stop and then I will start up again tomorrow in part two and make sure to let you know at the start of that where we um, begin. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I'm actually going to switch over to desktop view so that you guys can see the uh, PowerPoint that I put together on this, I'd like to stress also that um, this PowerPoint is not the fanciest PowerPoint that I've ever made, but it is also very functional, and I will be uploading it to Schoology uh, after I finish the broadcast. So let's get started. So to begin with, we have here the title screen, AP Euro Review, Major European Wars from 1337 to 1991, which is, of course, the end of the Cold War. In the background there, I have some British soldiers marching. Uh, you can tell that because they've got the old British and technically American doughboy styled helmets. Um, and let's just begin with the Hundred Years of War. We'll jump right in. Now, each of these slides you're going to notice is very similar, so let me just introduce you to the format. Uh, the title of the war is right here. Uh, so we're starting with the Hundred Years War. The years that it took place are right here. Uh, the belligerents simply means those who were involved, and I have color-coded it here with no particular emphasis on the colors. I didn't do red for England and blue for France. It just happened to work out that way. Um, so don't think like red guy is bad guy and blue guy is good guy or anything like that. I just did them different colors so that you would know that they are on different sides. I tried to, when I could, include losses and casualties, but sometimes uh, knowing the actual specific number of people uh, who were killed in battle uh, from various sorts of things is uh, is difficult to know. So sometimes down here, this isn't maybe the most accurate part of the PowerPoint. And two, sometimes I just don't have numbers to put in here. So um, this is this is kind of uh, take this area down here with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, going back up to the top here, I also have on each slide uh, the causes, major battles, and sometimes I kind of. Uh, don't talk about major battles. You'll understand as I go along that sometimes it's not prudent to talk about major battles, but give you a better idea of what the war was about. So this is kind of a free-for-all box, but I try to mention major battles in this one. And then finally down here, uh, talking about the significance or outcome of the actual uh, conflict itself. And so uh, if you haven't already done so, let's go ahead and read over this together. Um, the Hundred Years' War was a uh, hundred years long conflict, but uh, the most important thing to understand about the Hundred Years' War is that it wasn't a singular conflict. It's actually got three major phases to the war. And, and as with many, you're going to find this as you uh, 
learn about European history. As with many conflicts in history that, that end with years war, whether it's the Hundred Years War or the Thirty Years War or whatever, um, a lot of times it's not just, it's not like World War II where fighting is going on nonstop or something. Um, and even in World War II, we have that area where there's the Sitzkrieg. But anyway, uh, the Hundred Years' War, a lot of times, especially early on, these battles kind of start and stop. So that's something to remember as we go through this. It's not like that was just 100 straight years of, like, intense battles. They kind of they kind of uh, ebb and flow as the uh, as the years go on. But anyway, let's get back to this. Uh, who who could basically who could control France? That's the or who would control France? That's the major cause of the Hundred Years' War. There's a dynastical um, dispute involving the French and English uh, dynasties. Essentially, it, it goes back to what I was talking to you about earlier uh, in the French King's Review, where um, Edward the Third was actually closer related to the French king that died just before the Hundred Years' War started, but they didn't want to have, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the English uh, king take over the crown of France. And so that's when we see the rise of the House of Valois in France, and, uh, and it, it causes this war. The, the Hundred Years' War, the essential uh, lesson to remember about this is that although you may not be asked about the Hundred Years' War, um, it's good to know because it sets up the long-lasting uh, kind of animosity, I guess you would say, or, or competition between France and England. And really that lasts all the way up until World War I, uh, with only a few periods in there where they actually get along with one another. Uh, most of the time, especially in like the 1700s with like the Seven Years' War and the War of American Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars in the eight, early 1800s, uh, France and Britain are basically hated enemies of one another. Nonetheless, uh, there, the major battles are, I would, I would basically split the Hundred Years' War into three major phases. You, you have the Edwardian War, which of course is named after King Edward III, uh, who, was, who he believed he was the rightful ruler of France. Uh, then you have what's known as the Caroline War and the Lancastrian War. And uh, of course, because it lasted a hundred years uh, for all three of these to kind of start and finish on their own, uh, by the time that we get to the Lancastrian War, Edward is uh, long dead. Um, some of the major battles uh, were like the Battle of Crecy, uh, which ended with the Treaty of Brittany. And by the way, England uh, had a lot of success early on in the Hundred Years' War. And uh, there's a famous tale of, I want to say it was Henry V, who was like ready to go out and put the crown on his head and take over France. Um, but he ended up getting dysentery while riding out to Paris and uh, died. And then his um, less competent, I want to say brother or son, I, I would have to go back and look. Uh, we'll do an English King's Review, but takes over. Edward VI was, was more or less incompetent. And then France battles back in the last po portion of the Hundred Years' War. The Battle of Agincourt uh, is another major battle, uh, and Castillon, both of which were won by France. And ultimately, Britain uh, takes Calais, which is the British um, or the uh, the French port that's uh, right on the right on the northern coast of France. It's very close to. Um, Britain in terms of nautical distance it just it's a hop skip and a jump over the English Channel to get over to England from Calais um, Significance or outcome of the hundred years war basically feudal armies were replaced by professional standing armies uh, The hundred years war signals the end of the medieval era uh, longbowmen replaced heavy horses uh, especially the British longbow was a particularly uh, important unit of battle. And then uh, the or this was like the origins of English and French nationalism, and it started their rivalry, rivalry, as I mentioned before. And then, of course, it accelerated France from being a more of a feudal, decentralized monarchy to a centralized state. Now, this, isn't, this doesn't happen overnight, but historians oftentimes trace the origins of uh, the centralized state back to the Hundred Years' War. Real briefly here, uh, this is just an image that I have. It was actually an image that I showed in the original PowerPoint that I presented to you kids in class. This is, uh, you can see uh, longbowmen here uh, replacing heavy horsemen. And just a real quick, uh, basically this is an image from the Battle of Augencourt. Uh, Battle of Augencourt actually, I should mention, 
a uh, little bit of misinformation here. France won the Lancastrian War. When it says battles of Agincourt and Castillon here, uh, the English technically won the Battle of Agincourt. France won the overall Lan Lancastrian War, though, is what I was trying to say back there. Um, at any rate, <clears throat> getting back to this, uh, you can see here this is an image representing the Hundred Years' War, the Battle of Agincourt in the last part portion of the Hundred Years' War. Moving on, fall of Constant Constantinople. Uh, the fall of Constantinople happens in 1453. Constantinople, of course, was renamed Istanbul. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, I showed you guys in class a brief clip of the song by They Might Be Giants called Istanbul, not Constantinople, when we talked about this. Um, who were involved? Well, it was the fall of the Byzantine Empire, which is really, um, if Rome hadn't already really pretty much completely fallen by this point, some people, uh, I'm not one of them, but some people argue that this is like the last remnants of the Roman Empire um, that fall at this because the capital of Rome gets switched over to uh, Constantinople, named after Emperor Constantine, who of course brought Christianity to the Roman Empire. But anyway, fall of the Roman Empire, fall of the Byzantine Empire, I think is a little bit better way of putting it, at the hands of the Ottoman Turks. And um, <clears throat> the Ottomans were led by uh, Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II. Uh, the capture of Constantinople lasts seven weeks. It was a month-long siege, uh, or seven-week-long siege that lasted from April 6th, which was just last week, uh, to, well, April 6th, 1453 was obviously not last week, but commemorating it last week, we could have uh, in class, I forgot to. And then the city fell on May 29th, 1453. Uh, ended the Byzantine Empire. Uh, really, a lot of historians look at this as another, kind of similar to the uh, to the uh, Hundred Years' War. This is another key event that really we would say ends, officially ends the Middle Ages. It's a major blow to Christianity, of course, because Constantinople is uh, viewed as a um, kind of a major uh, city representative of Christianity. I think I got a little message here, so I'm going to go back to my deal. Did somebody say something? That picture was not from class. Uh, Calvin, no, there's not a q and I apologize for that. Um, Brenda, believe it or not, I actually did show that picture in my original PowerPoint. Um, but at any rate, let's get back to this real fast. Sorry, I know there's a little bit of a delay here, so uh, just bear with me. If you have any comments, I will hear them with that little bing sound. So uh, let's just keep going here. Um, and then, interestingly enough, a lot of people, you know, today, um, a lot of people today think about, um, you know, uh, the Middle East and, and Islam and so on in, in kind of extremist terms. And uh, believe it or not, contrary to kind of, I think, pop culture belief about um, radical versions of Islam in modern day, uh, contrary to popular belief, actually uh, the Muslims helped to revive the Greek and Roman studies back in uh, the you know, mid 1400s. They, they preserved many of these ancient texts from the Greeks and Romans. And, and it's really thanks to, uh, you know, in no small part, thanks to the Muslims uh, of, of the 1400s that we have the information that we have related to the Greek and, and uh, ancient Greece and Rome. So at any rate, uh, that's that's kind of a significance as well of the fall of Constantinople. Uh, they did preserve many of those treasures there. And then here we have an image. This one I did not show in class. Uh, this is the siege of Constantinople here. And you can see the Turks climbing up their wall with their scimitar-shaped swords and uh, crossbows down here. Let's see, do I have any, it says the siege of Constantinople as depicted between 1453 and 1475. Um, this is in the French, French um, National French Museum, I believe. And uh, cool image there. Let's move on. War of the Roses is our third conflict that we're going to talk about. Now, we're going to get more into the War of Roses when I do our English Kings review. But just really briefly, the War of Roses is kind of a civil war of sorts, I guess you would say. 
It's a dynastical, it's, it'd be, I'd be hard pressed to even call it a civil war because really it has more to do with uh, like dynastical families than it has to do with like national factions or something like that. But anyway, uh, the, the, the dynasty that rules England at this time from 1455 to 1487 is the plan the house of plantagenet or the uh, plantagenet dynasty and there's two major house descendants within the plantagenet dynasties and you might consider these folks kind of like um you know cousins of one another or kind of extended family and they are all just they are all descendants of edward the third who had too many sons for his own good Sometimes they call it the War of the Roses, though, because rather than saying the house between the war between the House of York and the House of Lancaster, we instead take the symbols that represented their houses, and this is kind of almost like loosely based in any real fact. But uh, the House of York alleged to have been represented by a white rose. The House of Lancaster alleged to have been re represented by a red rose, and so that's where we really get the term War of the Roses. Uh, there's a lot of history surrounding that that I'm not going to get into right now for the sake of time. Uh, but like I say, it's these dynastic disputes going back to Edward III of England having too many sons. Uh, they fought, once again, kind of like the Hundred Years' War in many different episodes, although it only lasts for 30-some years. Uh, and there's a lot of social and financial troubles from England losing the Hundred Years' War that kind of led to this problem because um, of the unrest of the, the rule of uh, Henry VI who of course had no relation uh, really to Henry VII of the Tudor dynasty. Um, Henry VI was House of Plantagenet. Uh, Henry VII was House of, uh, of Tudor. And uh, they're, they're mad. In 1455, this is right on the, the, the um, you know, heels of losing the Hundred Years' War, and, and people are kind of upset about that, and there's a lot of blame being thrown around. And we'll talk more about that, like I said, when we talk back again about the uh, English King's Review, but let's uh, talk major battles. There was a first and second battle of St. Albans, the Battle of Northampton, the Battle of Wakefield, but the most important, I would argue, from this period of time was the battle at Bosworth Field, and that was the one where Richard III was killed, and um, I think I, I told you guys in class, Richard III's body was discovered only a few years ago underneath a parking lot. Uh, they were doing a major excavation, where they believed uh, this this small little chapel or abbey stood, um, and they sure enough they found his remains kind of hastily buried there. And uh, only recently, within the last like couple of months, I want to say, um, put him in his final resting place. But uh, what's the significance of the War of Roses? It's the end of the Plantagenet dynasty. It's the beginning of the Tudor dynasty and Henry the Seventh. And um, this is, uh, you know, uh, an event kind of like the Hundred Years' War was for France. It's, a, it's an event that weakens feudal power of the nobles. It, it's strengthening a centralized monarchy. And you might think to yourself, that sounds really weird. How is it that a war, like the War of Roses, strengthens the monarchy when they're, they're fighting against one another? Well, believe it or not, the end of the war results in a recognition of the monarchy as being legitimate. And Henry VII's reign is really all about legitimizing himself as a ruler. And what's the first thing that he does but marry, um, you know, one of the daughters of, um, one of the daughters of, I have to go back, and Edward the Fourth, I believe, or Edward V, I would have to go back and double check because I'm not really well read on this right now, but he ultimately ends up marrying like the daughter of Edward IV or Edward V, I'd have to go back and check. And, and, and he's doing this to strengthen his, his, uh, his legitimacy as a ruler. Really the idea is, think about it kids, if you are voting, if you're voting for a president, right? The mere fact that you go out and vote is a recognition of the legitimacy of a centralized federal government. Um, and, and the mere fact that this war ends with nobles recognizing Henry VII as a legitimate monarch actually strengthens the image of the monarchy and strengthens people's opinions of 
the legitimacy of their governmental system in England at this time. So, like I say, I mean, just the mere recognition that this war ends without, you know, England turning into some anarchical, chaotic mess uh, is is evidence that 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 the monarchy was strengthened and centralized during this time. Uh, and then finally, it kind of ends the medieval period in England. And after this, we see the rise of the Renaissance, uh, which had already been kind of underway um, in Italy by this time. And here, just to remind you, is uh, in case you had forgotten what he looks like, this is Richard III, Richard Duke of Gloucester. If you remember me talking about the Duke of Gloucester, he, he kind of uh, killed his nephews who were very young. Um, well, we say he killed them. We don't know if he actually did or not, but let's face it, they don't, they found him hundreds of years later buried underneath a staircase in the Tower of London, so probably they were killed by him. And uh, here his here was where his skeletal remains were. Uh, you can see he's famous uh, in his portrayal um, of, uh, in, in, in the Shakespearean portrayal of Richard III, uh, they, they talk about him having this really strong curvature of the spine, and sure enough, he, he did, he, he did have a, pretty serious case of scoliosis. Um, they might be exaggerating a bit here, but not much, I don't think. <clears throat> Spanish Reconquista. Uh, what is the Spanish Reconquista or Reconquista? Uh, well, it ends in 1492, but I, you don't need to know a ton necessarily about the Reconquista so long as you understand that it lasts nearly 800 years long. So the Reconquista really starts a long time before our our focus in AP European history. But who was it between? Well, you had a number of Catholic kingdoms, particularly in Spain. Remember, Spain doesn't become unified until much later. Uh, so there are these independent kingdoms there, the Kingdom of Navarre, the Kingdom of Leon, the Kingdom of Aragon, uh, the Kingdom of Castile. All of these different kingdoms exist in the Iberian Peninsula, which is, of course, where Spain is uh, located today. And then you have the Kingdom of Portugal as well. Um, and who are the Catholic kingdoms fighting against? But, of course, the Muslim conquerors. And um, that's maybe a little bit of a historically biased term to call them conquerors. But um, you have the Almohads, but particularly the Moors. Uh, the, the Moors, M-O-O-R-S there, were the, the Muslim folks. Uh, residing around Granada at the fall of the um, at the end of the Spanish Reconquista, the fall of Granada is when the Muslims and Jews were killed, enslaved, or expelled by Ferdinand and Isabella. Ferdinand being king of uh, Aragon, and then Isabella being queen of Castile. Um, and we have the Spanish Inquisition uh, was those Muslims who converted to Christianity later were expelled. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it's pretty basic. It's basically this really strong anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic movement in the Iberian Peninsula, um, which today makes up Spain. What's the significance of this? Well, basically, it, el it eliminates Muslim and Jewish influence in various Iberian kingdoms, and it paves the way for Castile and Aragon to unite and eventually become Spain down the line. Of course, Spain probably... Uh, other than the Spanish Reconquista, one of the things that Spain is really well known for at this time in 1492 would be financing Christopher Columbus's trip over to the New World and really changing the face of uh, of the entire world, the face of history. I mean, it, it, it single-handedly uh, changes everything. So the discovery of the New World is also closely attributed to Spain right around the same time. Uh, this is an image here uh, where it's called the surrender or the capitulation of Granada. I want to emphasize that, of course, this painting was uh, created or painted many, many, many years later. This is done in almost like a, um, I don't know what you would describe that as, maybe more of an, not, not abstract, but, oh, I, I would argue this kind of like a, Monet-esque type style. It's not quite Monet. It's a little bit, it's a little bit different than that. It's it's realistic but not realistic. Um, and so this is an image from from many many centuries later. Don't think of this as being associated with the art that was being created during 1492. It's this is a creation from the late 1800s. This is like a um, 
I'm blanking on the term right now, of course, uh, more of a, maybe a bit of a romantic um, piece than it is anything else. Okay. <clears throat> Let's continue. And we are now moving, whoopsie. Let's skip forward here. To the Italian Wars of 1494 to 1559. And once again, I'd like to stress that these are not just, this is not straight fighting. Um, France withdrew from Italy many, many times during this uh, during this time span from 1494 to 1559. Who were the major belligerents in this? Well, you had France, you had the Ottoman Empire, who was, uh, you know, thanks to a treaty that uh, was signed by Louis the... Uh, Louis XII, I'm going to have to go back and check that as well, but nonetheless, a treaty that was signed between France and the Ottoman Empire uh, that, that really kind of solidified their trade connection for many centuries to come. And then uh, France was known at this time for hiring, hiring Swiss mercenaries, <clears throat> so they took quite a few of those along with them to uh, their uh, invasion of Italy as well. Who are they fighting against? Well, they're fighting against the Holy Roman Empire, uh, and the primary reason for that has to do with kind of... Uh, uh, well, a number of French kings, but especially Francis I's disagreement of, upon who should inherit uh, the, the crown of the Holy Roman Empire and become the emperor. Um, you know, the famous joke, of course, about the Holy Roman Empire is that it was not holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't really an empire. So at any rate... Um, of course, you're going to have some Italian states at this time. And much like Spain, remember that Italy is not united yet. Italian unification doesn't happen until, you know, the, basically the eight, late 1800s, second half of the 19th century. So you have the Republic of Venice, you have the Duchy of Milan, you have the Republic of Florence, you have the Papal States, and then you have the Kingdom of Naples, and, uh, or Napoli, which is in the southern part of France. Um, what, what's the cause of this? Well, like always, it has something to do with dynastic disputes over the Duchy of Milan and the Kingdom of Naples. And basically, there's a number of Italian states that are trying to play one another against each other. And I'm not going to get into all the details because it's extraordinarily complicated. Uh, but basically, it's these different Italian states. Uh, and and <clears throat> sometimes they are actually allied with France. Like Milan will be allied with France and then they'll switch sides. And then Venice will be briefly allied with France and they'll switch sides. I mean, it, it's difficult to tell because all these Italian states are trying to position uh, one another against each, against each other. And it ends up being a very complicated series of conflicts. Long story short, essentially these battles are off and on. You've got three major uh, kings of France that we talked about previously in our in our previous review on the French kings. You got Charles the Eighth, you got uh, Louis the Twelfth, and you got Francis the First. And those are kind of the first three major um, series of conflicts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Series of conflicts uh, that that the that France uh, invades Italy. Uh, you know, based upon the, the actions of those kings. It's a significant outcome. It represented a, a revolution in military technology. And this is this would be really good if you ever get a question on, like a, a FRQ question on the significance of the French, uh, you know, Italian wars. You know, one of the things that happens during these years is there's a there's a few major changes uh, in how battles are fought. And so this is like one of the first times that we see the use of field artillery, which would be like cannons and things of that nature. Uh, keep in mind that the cannons were not particularly accurate during this time. Nonetheless, they were used culverins, bombards, these sorts of things were used in battle. And then, so that, that represents kind of new military technology that's being used. Also, they're using new tactics. Um, they're, they're using these army pulled cannons. So these men pull these cannons onto the battlefield. Um, and, and that's a particularly new tactic that they use. Um, also, they're using new types of in, infantry. Um, what some of you might have heard of an arquebus before. An arquebus is like a, 
it's like an early gun. And so a person who use an arc, uses an arquebus is an arquebusier. And that's what this says here. Arquebusiers are early gunnery units. These are um, uh, basically a super, super fundamental early version of a musket. Uh, they're not particularly useful much farther than even maybe 30 feet away. Um, incredibly inaccurate, but nonetheless, uh, a, definitely a new type of uh, infantry. And then uh, you went from, it's not that pikes didn't exist before, but pikemen's techniques really advanced during this time. And pikemen as a unit of, of infantry is uh, particularly important during this war. Sometimes these are referred to as the habsburg Valois Wars. So if you ever hear about the habsburg Valois Wars, the reason for that, of course, is that the Holy Roman Empire was ruled by the Habsburgs. The French were ruled by the House of Valois uh, of the Capetian dynasty of a dynasty of Capet, C-A-P-E-T, um, and House of Loy is part of that. So that's that's sometimes what they're called, and and otherwise they'll be known as the uh, the Italian Wars. Uh, this is an image, a little bit difficult to see probably from where you're at. Uh, just I put in notes for each of these images so that I wouldn't have to memorize all the information. Um, one of the famous battles of the Italian Wars was known as the Battle of Pavia, uh, and in, that took place in 1525. And this is actually, the reason the image is kind of difficult to see is because it's actually not a painting, it's a tapestry. And so um, it was woven at Brussels in about 1528. Um, and that is still on display in a museum somewhere in Europe um, from current slide. So that's a tapestry. You can kind of see it's got a very fabric-y texture to it, but Battle of Pavia. Then we move on to the German Peasants War. You might remember this one because now we're moving into a period probably best characterized as the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation has its beginnings in, well, that's this is a bit of a misnomer to say this, but we'll say that it has its beginnings in uh, Wittenberg, uh, which is in Germany, which of course is the uh, town where uh, Martin Luther posts his 95 theses on Wittenberg Cathedral, and he is himself a, uh, you know, a monk or a, a, a you know, law trained, <clears throat> excuse me, a law trained uh, monk at the uh, University of Wittenberg. Ultimately, the German Peasants' War uh, came as a product of basically princes trying to force uh, peasants into serfdom. It's a, it's a nightmare. The, the peasants uh, were supposed to, some of the freer peasants of Germany uh, were subjected to tax increases during this time. The kind of the irony of the German peasants war is, is this. The German peasants war is in part a product of a willingness saying, hey, man, like that's not appropriate. We shouldn't be questioning the, we shouldn't be questioning the church. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, we shouldn't be uh, accepting, sorry, I'm getting a couple of warning notices on my screen here. We shouldn't be um, taking indulgences, that's the church is abusing their authority and so on and so forth. So what the peasants do is they say, well, if it's okay to question the Catholic church, then maybe it's okay to question the German princes forcing us into serfdom. Well, interestingly, as soon as the argument turns to like a class slash social hierarchy slash economic issue now all of a sudden it's not okay to question authority not saying that it was necessarily okay for uh luther to question authority there were definitely a lot of opponents in the catholic church that really did not like it um but the german peasants war is not at all supported by martin luther and you might think that it would be because you'd say to yourself oh well martin luther he questioned authority and he was rising up against a system that he thought was unjust but as soon as it turns into the peasants questioning the like wealthy landowning nobles uh no that's not okay and and 
uh, you know, Martin Luther being, he was somewhat of humble backgrounds, but he's kind of a highfalutin, well-known sort of a guy at this time. And the last thing that he wants to be associated with is some giant peasants revolt that's going to discredit his, you know, uh, Protestant movement. And so he does everything that he can to basically distance himself from the German peasants war. If you recall, we recently did a, a DBQ on the German peasants war. Um, let's talk a little bit about major battles. Peasants often created lists of grievances and, and these peasants would create these lists of grievances um, and hire these officers to lead them and then raise their banner in rebellion. Now, you know, when you say a revolt, when you say German peasants revolt, you know, it kind of has this connotation about it where you think it's like this spontaneous revolt and people just freaked out and went and grabbed their pitchforks and started setting buildings on fire. Well, there was some of that, but believe it or not, these are actually pretty well organized rebellions. I mean, no one really get re like no one's going to say I'm revolted and now I'm going to sit down and calmly write a list of grievances about everything that upsets me related to serfdom. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know. This is to call it a revolt. It almost makes it seem like it's, like it's this spontaneous, uncontrollable riot of some sort. And it's really not so much a riot. It's a pretty well thought out event. Um, of course, it is put down and quite swiftly and harshly, I might add. Um, the movement fails. Uh, each city that rebelled had nobility that restored order in their own kind of ways. Um, typically, though, it was pretty harsh. Um, later on, kind of almost the most interesting part of the German Peasants' War is that later on, Marx and Engels, and of course I'm referring to Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, used the German Peasants' Revolt in their arguments on like the inevitability of class warfare, right? So Marx and Engels use this as, an, as just yet another example, and especially were particularly focused on the French Revolution, but um, they went as far back as the German Peasants' Revolt to explain the, na the, the nature of class warfare. Um, and so this is, that's kind of an interesting in its own right about the German Peasants' War. Real quickly, just to show you where some of these places are, Memmingen is down here. Uh, then you, of course, have like Würzburg up here. Um, these are where some of the major battles took place. Um, there was a there was a, a battle as far north as Frankenhausen, uh, but uh, the 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 most uh, you know volatile areas here are kind of in dark red. Um, here's Freiburg. This is right in the middle of the Black Forest. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Black Forest before, and so keep in mind that you know a lot of these northern uh, states are going to be a little bit more Protestant, and the closer that you get to Rome. Uh, in southern Germany down here is the what what were the remember Germany's not unified at this time but the southern German states down here the closer you get to to Rome uh, the the more likely it is that you're going to see uh, you know the the states turn uh, or, or remain to be Catholic. All right, uh, let's move on. The Ottoman Habsburg Wars, uh, Mr. Knight. Are you kidding me? Ottoman Habsburg, Habsburg, Valois, how are we ever going to get this straight? Well, keep in mind, the Valois is a reference to the French dynasty, and the, uh, the French have an agreement with the Ottomans, a long-standing agreement. Not to mention, the French also don't like the Habsburgs. So it makes sense that these two would be pitted against one another in this particular conflict. Um, the Habsburg dynasty against the Ottoman Empire. Now, look at the years up here, 1526 to 1791. Clearly, clearly they are not fighting this entire time. Okay, this spans two full centuries and a half, really. So uh, there are many battles that take place intermittently. To list them all here would be really redundant and unnecessary. Probably the most important one, the one that I could see you really being asked about, is the naval battle that took place at Lepanto in 1571, and that was a decisive Ottoman defeat. Um, what's the whole deal here? Remember, the Ottoman Empire is primarily in the Middle East. Turkey, uh, sometimes as far over as the, the Balkan states, and there's a few times in, in early on here in this uh, Ottoman Habsburg War 
where the Ottomans are knock, knock, knocking on Austria's door. And uh, really, if you think about how close Vienna, which is the capital of Austria, was taken, um, I mean, they, they had good reason to, to be pretty uh, wary of Ottoman intentions in the Balkan region. And so later on, the Austrian Empire actually takes back much of their possessions. Of course, by World War I, that whole region is a nationalist powder keg um, where you kind of have these folks who for a long time were run by the Ottomans, but you know many of them are Slavic and many of them are not Muslim. And so you're kind of asking yourself, like, what am I if I'm not Muslim and I'm run by the Ottomans? And But then again, you have to consider, of course, that the Ottoman Empire was a little bit more tolerant of Christianity and religious diversity than say, oh, I don't, I don't know, France or something like that. Um, and so at any rate, it's a part of this, of course, is, is some something to do with religious differences, but a lot of this just kind of has to do with uh, the Ottoman conquest of Southeast Europe. This was a lot of territorial disputes. Uh, the Lepanto battle I mentioned already. And then finally, what's the significance of this? Well, by the 1800s, both the Austrians and the Ottomans start to lose their power. If you really think about it, the, the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire are two of the most notable empires for the majority of the first semester of the course. By the time that we get to the 1800s, we are seeing Austria's empire and the Ottoman Empire uh, diminish in power, uh, instead kind of being replaced by the nationalist movements, the, the, the uh, centralizing of Germany and Italy to a lesser extent, but uh, but also including the, you know the nationalism uh, exemplified starting in the you know French Revolution and and the you know the, the French state and the English state England France and Germany by the time that you get to the late 1800s are much more uh, prominent in international affairs uh, even including the Russians you might even argue the Russians as well and then finally they left the Balkan region basically a nationalistic mess, as I mentioned before. So, you know, by the time that we get to the, the outbreak of World War I, we have several crises down in the Balkans, and, uh, and that ultimately the third, the third crisis down there would, en would end up resulting in World War I. Uh, this is an image here. I'm just going to go back to my little cheat sheet. This is an image representing the Battle of Lepanto. Um, it took place... In 1571, it was a naval engagement between the Allied Christian forces, the Habsburg, and the Ottoman Turks. It's uh, oil on canvas. It was created in the late 1500s, a.k.a. late 16th century. And I put in a couple of things down here to reference where I pulled the image from. Um, next that we're doing here is the Munster Rebellion. You might remember the Munster Rebellion. It has to do with the Anabaptists. This took place in 1534 to 35. You had these radical Anabaptists in Munster. Now, normally Munster has, uh, if you've ever heard of Munster cheese before, it's one of my favorites, actually. Munster has the two little dots here above the U, but I was uh, too lazy to find the alt code. You can type like alt 0134 and stuff, and it'll give you special characters. I was too lazy to figure out what it was, so I just put up here the, the non-German U. Um, the Munster Rebellion uh, took place, basically happens after the, about 10 years after the German Peasants' War. Um, a number of Protestant radicals attempted to establish a theocracy, like almost like a communal sectarian, sectarian means religious ties, government at Munster in Westphalia, which is a state, a German state at this time. And there, I wouldn't say there's any major battles of the Munster Rebellion. The Munster Rebellion is, is its own isolated incident. Uh, what ends up happening is you have a number of uh, these leaders. The most notable of them all is this guy. His name is Jan Mathis. And then there's another guy named John of Leiden. Uh, and you might recognize these two guys' names if you, if you went back and looked at your uh, notes from first semester during the Protestant Reformation. Jan Mathis and John of Leiden, along with this guy, Bernard Rothman. These are the three major guys that lead the Anabaptist uprising in Munster. And um, what is the main idea behind Anabaptism? Um, well, or Anabaptist, uh, Protestant, 
denomination. What it is, it's the it's the notion of adult baptism. So you have to uh, make a conscious decision as an adult to become baptized. Basically, their belief is that that children uh, don't have the you know ability to make a to to devote to decide to devote their whole lives to God. Um, th so these radical Anabaptists take over and they basically try and establish this theocracy, which is like a religious run government. And they, th of course, it's met with severe resistance from the Catholics in the region. Uh, the city was taken by the besiegers on June 24th, 1535. Basically what happened was there was this giant besieging of the city that was led by the uh, cardinal that had been expelled from that town. Um, I want to say it was a cardinal. It might have been archbishop. Anyway, this major Catholic figure in the church leads this siege on the castle and or on the uh, on the town of Munster, and they take it over uh, in 1535. And whichever major leaders of this revolt weren't killed already, uh, they were captured, imprisoned, or executed. So it ultimately results in. Uh, basically, the Anabaptists uh, kind of look at the Munster Rebellion. And they say, uh, yeah, so I guess Anabaptism is kind of losing some appeal. And what we see is that whatever remaining Anabaptists are left over, they convert to or they change their name to the Mennonites. And you might remember the Mennonites because they, they reject everything to do with violence instead preaching about love and compassion. So they're the Dutch Anabaptists would be the Mennonites. Um, and they kind of keep the, uh, the less violent sentimentality of Anabaptism around for uh, many centuries to come. So that's the Munster Rebellion. I don't have any images related to that, but um, when they find uh, John, I wanna say when they find Jan Mathis here, they take him and burn him at the stake. So uh, things don't end well for him. Uh, as you can imagine. Pilgrimage of Grace. Uh, the Pilgrimage of Grace was an English uprising, similar kind of in some ways to um, the, the German Peasants' Revolt, it, because, and I'll tell you what the similarity is, is that there's a lot of economic complaints that are kind of tied to this. So what is the Pilgrim of Grace, Pilgrimage of Grace all about? Basically, you had a number of people involved in this. Um, and it, it, it's kind of an interesting thing. You'd think that the Pilgrimage of Grace would be like a peasant's revolt. It's not all peasants, though. Um, what it is, is it's an uprising, particularly in northern England and in, in a region called Lincolnshire, uh, which is where the whole thing starts off. And it kind of spreads around northern England. And, and the way that it got started was basically... Henry VIII's break from the Roman Catholic Church. If you'll recall, Henry VIII was the King of England who had six different wives, uh, the first of which was Catherine of Aragon. She was a devout um, Catholic, being that she was from Spain. Uh, and ultimately, he goes out of his way to divorce her um, and it is not approved, the annulment is not approved by the Pope. So because of that, when he divorces her in favor of his second wife, Anne Boleyn, uh, the people freak out because the way that he gets it done is basically to break from the Roman Catholic Church and create his own Protestant denomination, which became known as uh, Anglicanism, which, which comes from Anglo like the England, right, A-N-G-L, you know, Anglo, that whole term Anglo-Saxon comes from uh, the fact that those folks are, are based in England. And Anglic the Anglican faith is based in England. Uh, a lot of kids misread that like Angelican or something like that. That's not what it's saying. It says Anglican. Um, so uh, anyway, it was likely a number of economic complaints, though, related to poor harvests and high food prices in northern England and the fact that they had written to the king many times and he basically had ignored them up there. So this is kind of a dual purpose thing. But what they do is they have a funny way of going about it. Basically, what they say is they're like, yeah, no, we're not doing we're not rising up against the king. No, what we're doing is we're just against the king's policies. 
not the king himself. Don't get us wrong. We love the king. It's just that his he hasn't really paid a whole lot of attention to policies we don't like, which is like, that's like saying, it's Mr. Knight, it's not you that I don't like. It's just, it's just your class and everything about you that I don't like. It's not you, like you as a human being, you're fine, but it's just like your personality traits and your voice and your face that we don't like. But you, you're fine, right? Like, so that's not that's not an argument that sits very well with King Henry VIII, as you could imagine. And ultimately, all of the ringleaders, but these I included the four major, or I mean uh, the three major ones here. The three major ones were Robert Ask, uh, Thomas Darcy, and Robert Constable. And um, your name was basically Mud uh, if you were one of these three guys, uh, because they were all killed. So. <laughs> which is no that can't hardly be a surprise to any of them uh they probably knew they had that coming uh the king at first actually doesn't execute them but then he does he kind of changes his mind he's like yeah we got to take care of this so you don't want any uprisings because that's going to question the legitimacy of your your rule right so it really basically comes as no surprise that these folks were killed along with the other 213 some odd uh, folks who rose up against the king, including the leaders and other high-ranking citizens. Uh, but basically what they said is the reason that we rose up is because you closed all the monasteries. So, um, you know, they, they're revolting at the fact that the king is not respecting the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's traditionally viewed as mostly a tragic failure, kind of like the German Peasants' War was. That would be another thing that they have in common. And then finally, uh, what's the outcome? Well, England remains Protestant. Uh, with the exception of Mary the First, who was Catholic, but she only reigns for a very short period of time before she's replaced by her half sister, uh, Elizabeth the First. Now, remember, Mary is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, and Mary was really close with her mom. She despised her father. Um, so he's like your first, your first major queen of England uh, that kind of you know takes the throne as a as a female monarch. I mean, it's not to say that there weren't queens beforehand, but Mary the first is the first like female queen of England that, uh, that kind of has, you know, um, more say than, than a male, any other male figure, uh, which is, that's notable. Uh, and then finally, uh, the monasteries remain dissolved. So they don't, even in spite of the fact that they do this uprising, it doesn't result in, the monasteries being started back up. Um, this was the banner that they used, and it's a very dramatic banner. It doesn't look very dramatic, but this is red symbolizing the color of the blood of Christ. And um, here you had like the wounds of Christ, right? So basically, like this is the this is the imagery that they use as the representation of like, you know. We're doing this in Christ's name and, and, and closing the monasteries is an insult to the wounds of Christ and how he died for our sins and all this, you know, like really dramatic, very uh, emotionally appealing arguments about, about their uprising when really a lot of it, uh, to be honest, was, was economically based and how they, they were kind of sad and upset that the uh, king wasn't paying as much attention as he could to the northern uh, shires, as they used to be called, of, of England. All right, um, we've got about five minutes here until I'm an hour in, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up for where we're at now. We're on, uh, we're making good progress here. We're already on slide number 19, so this is taking me a lot less time to go through than it did to make it. But anyway, uh, talk about the French Wars of Religion here, and then we'll we'll call it an evening, and I'll do the second half tomorrow evening. The French Wars of Religion take place over a span of about 40 years, starting in 1562 to 1598. Um, it's between the French Huguenots and England on one side, and you're going to think to yourself, wait a second, Mr. Knight, I thought you said that the French don't ally themselves with England very often. Well, they don't, but I'll tell you why the English were supporting the French Huguenots is because the Huguenots are Calvinists, and the English have already by this point broken from the Catholic Church. And so, you know, the English are basically doing anything they can. Remember, France is, is traditionally Catholic. And so what England is actually doing here is they are kind of sticking it to the French Catholics in support of the spread of Protestantism. Why? 
because spreading Protestantism in France, although these guys will welcome the help from England, uh, which was marginal at best anyway, uh, really what that does is it sows dissent, internal dissent in France. And England will do anything to kind of uh, cause France some internal dissent at this time. So don't think that England's just going out of the kindness of their heart to support uh, the uh, the French Huguenots over there. It has less to do with that and more to do with the fact that they were interested in seeing France weakened from, from internal conflict. So uh, that's on one side. On the other side, you've got what was known as the Catholic League, which was basically any major nation supporting Catholicism, uh, including, uh, you know, um, France itself. And then you got Spain and the Duchy of Savoy. Uh, and then over here, what are the causes? Well, basically, uh, it's once again, factional disputes between the House of Bourbon and the House of Guise. Uh, the House of, of Bourbon, the Bourbon dynasty, was started by um, Henry IV of France, who you might remember we talked about. Uh, he was the first kind of French Calvinist king. And as you could imagine, all of the major French Catholic nobles uh, they did not like the idea of their crown being taken over by a Calvinist Protestant. And remember, the Calvinists are seen as kind of extremist Protestants. Um, even though, oddly enough, by the time that he's assassinated, Henry IV, despite his, you know, scary uh, French Calvinist Huguenot belief system, uh, he's known as Henry the Good. And the reason, of course, is because he does all those things to help improve France and stuff in spite of all the wars that are going on. Uh, related to his uh, his religious upbringing. But anyway, uh, one of the major uh, notable events was the uh, that caused the French wars of religion was the massacre of Vasi, um, Vasi being a town in 1562. Basically, it was the murder of Huguenots in an armed action led by France with the Duke of Guise of France. Uh, the Duke of Guise was Catholic, clearly. And um, so anyway, they kill a whole bunch of Huguenots and, and well, the Huguenots don't want to be killed. So that ultimately gives them uh, fuel in their fire to defend themselves. And, uh, and thus we get the French Wars of Religion. Major battles. Uh, there were kind of eight major wars over this 36 year time span. Um, some major events was the St. Bartholomew Days Saint, excuse me, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which was, of course, an anti-Protestant massacre of Huguenots at the hands of Catholic mobs. Uh, so we are, we are seeing the deaths of Huguenots left and right here, uh, French Calvinists. And then there were uh, five days of Catholics massacring Calvinist families during this thing. Uh, in total, really, between everyone, 10,000 people end up being killed during the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. It's a uh, it's a pretty brutal event in French history. Uh, what's the significance? You're going to remember these two things. These should sound familiar to you. Uh, the French wars of religion end in 1598 with the Edict of Nantes. And the Edict of Nantes granted the Huguenots substantial rights. Basically, it comes to a point where the Catholics are like, okay, we've massacred enough of you. Uh, we're okay to kind of cool, cool our jets now. And it, it opens a path for secularism to start uh, spreading in France. What is secularism? It's the idea that we, we can kind of start, I don't want to say separate church and state yet. That's maybe taking a bit too far. But secularism is the welcoming of scientific ideas. It's the, it's the idea that it, there, there is validity in studying earthly uh, phenomena rather than just trying to explain everything through religious phenomena. So it opens a path for secularism and ultimately down the road, of course, science to start spreading in France and then a, a tolerance for the Huguenots. Um, why did I include this edict later? Well, here's the thing. The Edict of Fontainebleau has nothing to do necessarily with the French of wars of religion directly. More, actually, it has to do with the rule of the Sun King, Louis XIV, who passes the Edict of Fontainebleau. And the Edict of Fontainebleau, what it does is it negates the Edict of Nantes. And the reason goes back to that belief that the Sun King, uh, uh, Louis 
the 14th had about religion. And that is basically that, you know, he was a big divine right sort of a guy and basically said, hey, whoever's the, the leader of a state, whoever is the prince of a state or the king of a state, so shall the state be that religion, okay, of that leader. So, um, and that goes back to that, Cuis uh, regio, cuis religio, I can't speak Latin, so you'll have to forgive my pathetic rendition of that quote, but it goes back to that old divine right quote uh, that basically settled the, uh, you know, uh, the German state's issues with the rising of Protestantism, where each prince was allowed to determine what his um, little uh, territory would, you know, what religion his little territory would be. So basically the Edict of Fontainebleau revoked, revoked the Edict of Nantes. And the last little thing that I have to show you in this section of the PowerPoint is the depiction of the St. Bartholomew's Day's Massacre uh, by Francois Dubois in uh, 1572 to, to 50, it's sometime painted in 1572 to 84. So this is kind of more of the art that you would see from uh, the late 1500s. It's not the most fancy piece of all time by any stretch of imagination, but you can see here the use of linear perspective and so on, which would, of course, start started to have been used much earlier on in the Renaissance. This is the sort of thing that you would not have seen in medieval art, um, is some, some, you know, cogent display of uh, depth in the painting. Uh, so anyway, that gives you an idea of what kind of the massacre of the Huguenots looked like at the um, at the massacre of Saint, the, the St. Bar Bartholomew Day's massacre by the Catholics. 